Good evening, everyone. Welcome to season two of the 1960s project. We are talking about voices from the 1960s. People who graduated in the 1960s will be recalling, reminiscing and reflecting on the years 1960 to 1969. We'll be sharing tiny thoughts and large memories. My name is Jerome Page, and thank you for joining us. While we're waiting for people to gather, I'd like to remind you to like and follow us on Facebook. Also to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And you can also read and comment on our blogs. Uh, this today's session, as I indicated, starts our episode. Today's episode starts session two, season two of our live. And we're going to be talking about the future. Uh, uh, our guest, who I'll introduce you to in a few minutes, uh, graduated from high school in 1966. But there are a number of books and movies and television shows that were in the 1960s. Some of you might have remembered the Jetsons. And in fact, if you remember any of these shows or books, maybe you can drop in the chat box one of your favorite futuristic shows or novels that focused on the future or science fiction novels. Uh, writers like uh, Frank Herbert, and Dune was a book that appeared in the 60s. Star Trek started broadcasting in the 60s. Ursula Le Guin wrote her book, uh, the, the, um, which focused on a scientific uh, future, a future. Others included uh, Samuel Delaney, who is a black um, mystery scientific, science fiction writer. So, uh, and so there was also, um, I mentioned the Dunes, I mentioned the Jetsons. Let's see who else I can remember that was popular in the 1960s, Star Trek. Um, yeah, so th those are some of the examples. So uh, back in the, if we remember the Jetsons, they had this analog view of what the future would look like. And now we are digital and we will be talking with our, our guests about what it means to, to think about the future. So I'd like to uh, invite Robert Nielsen to join us here. I'll stop sharing my screen. Okay. Bob, how are you? Good, thank you, Jerome, and thank you for inviting me. Great. So, Bob, um, when I was reading your blog, you started off by saying that um, that somebody asked you what you do, and you said you think about the future. What does it mean to think about the future? Well, I think a lot of people are grounded in the past, and um, you can learn from history, but and you can uh, you can anticipate what happens, but I think the two words of leadership that I uh, always keep in the back of my head are, if you can't imagine it, you can't make it happen. And uh, I think GE was the one uh, back a while ago who had a slogan that said, imagination at work. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think um, also the word anticipate, unless you anticipate what's coming down the pike, I don't care if it's in your personal life or your business life, um, you know, you're just gonna go down the same old road. And uh, I always like to kind of say, well, what's next? And then that always intrigued me. And then how you actually put that together into a coherent whole in your personal life as well as your business life. How did you come to be a futurist? Did you you grow up that way, or what, what were some of your personal or academic or professional 
uh, your background that led you to be thinking about the future? Well, I think um, in undergraduate school, I had one professor, Dr. Eber Spencer, um, PhD Tufts guy, and I took a couple of uh, law courses from him in a full year of political theory. And um, he was phenomenal in terms of saying, okay, uh, what does this all mean and how, how does it apply uh, not only now, but in the future? So he was always pushing you to apply what was, uh, uh, let's say, whether it was case law, international law, or um, you know, political concepts, and then to say, well, how would you apply it in the future? So that got me interested. Um, and then later on, um, I, in my doctoral work at the University of Southern California, I really uh, focused on some science and technology policy and how it applies not only now, but into the future. And then I got, I had been through so many darn strategic plans in, in organizations and nobody can get through a strategic plan, you know, without just falling asleep. It, you know, it can cure an insomniac. So that's why I kind of came up with the whole notion of futuristic scenarios, short stories that paint a vivid picture of what the future would look like told through the eyes of a protagonist. And it's at a date certain in the future, let's say, you know, on July 4th, 2027. And then you go on with the story. The whole notion of why stories, people identify with stories. Cognitive psychology says that you identify with stories. You don't necessarily identify with abstract concepts. So therefore, people identify with stories and um, they take them to heart. And you were there, Go ahead. Yeah, were, was there anything in your pre-college or high school years or family life that that you woke up one day and you said, I'm, I'm really cooked on this thing about thinking forward? Well, I, I think a little bit uh, of it was, um, you know, the Kennedy assassination, uh, I think it was 1963. I was in French class and, you know, we, we were all shocked. And we say, what happens next? What happens next? And then, you know, Martin Luther King's speech, the I have a dream speech was in essence all future oriented. And, you know, after the um, assassination of RFK, you kind of said, holy mackerel, what's what's the country coming to? What's next? And then, you know, growing up in the 60s also, you had um, uh, the Vietnam War. And, you know, am I going to go as a, uh, an officer or uh, in the army, get drafted, go as an enlisted person? So you had to anticipate what you wanted to do. So that was kind of the formative stuff. On the family side, uh, of your question. Um, yeah, everybody got together and they heard all of the, all of the family stories, what your crazy uncles and aunts did and whatever else. And then when the stories got told over and over again, I would always try to say, Hey, well, what are you going to do tomorrow? What are you going to do the next day? What are you going to do a week from now? You know, and, and what did, what did your aunts and uncles say? What you, <clears throat> you just, what, what did they, did they bop you in your head and say, get away? No, no, they they just, you know, I mean, if I was, uh, you know, maybe I was in my teen years, you know, maybe it was just kind of like a snot nosed kid doing that. But, um, you know, they, they were very good about it. I grew up in a Norwegian household and nobody really challenged anybody <laughs> too much on those kind of things. Everybody went along with whatever people were saying. Nobody so, rocked the boat too much. OK, so you 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 went, you, you went to. Um... You got your undergraduate degree, and you you mentioned a faculty member that was was important in shaping your thinking about looking toward the future. Uh, you said you ended up in um, in graduate school and focusing on science and technology. That was at the University of Southern California um, at, when I did my doctoral work, and um, also in that vein, I mean, you know, the degrees in public administration, public policy, and then I was always concerned about public policy, and specifically science and technology policy. Well, we, we met in, I guess, 1996 at the, uh, we were both on the faculty at the right. Information Resources Management College at the National Defense University. What did you do prior to 1996 that led you to the Information Resources Management College? I actually um, 
was there was only one or two people chosen from the Department of Health and Human Services to attend the Industrial College of the Armed Forces, and I applied and I was selected to go. So I spent a year um, at the National Defense University as a student. And, um, you know, this is what called the highest level of professional military education. And um, I liked it. And I liked uh, working with a whole bunch of smart people. And then I said, well, you know, I, I've got to go and invest in myself and, 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 and get a PhD uh, if I want to, you know, follow this path. And that's what I did. And then, and when did you join the uh, Information Resources Management College? What year? I think it was, I think it was 1989 or 1990. And at that okay. time, it was the uh, Department of Defense Computer Institute, which moved over to the National Defense uh, uh, University uh, at Fort McNair in downtown Washington. And um, then we became a full college of, of the university, uh, specializing in both uh, information resources management and what they later on a little bit uh, at the School of Information Warfare and Strategy, what they call the information component of national power, which is now a lot of uh, talk naturally about cyber operation. And okay. I wrote one book back then called uh, Sun Tzu and Information Warfare, which is okay. totally out of date now. Yeah, I, I remember that. So. Bring, it's bringing back memories as we as we, we talk about the future. I'm also taking a trip down memory lane here. <laughs> <laughs> See if I can manage these these two time frames. So when I, I joined the national unit, uh, the information you, information resources management college, you were focusing on strategic planning. That was the big thing. There was the government. Um, what was it? Uh, the government the reform act. Performance results act. Right, and all the agencies had to come up with strategic plans and come up with performance measures. And we offered a lot of sessions, uh, classes on that for different for, for different people in the agencies. So at what point did you shift over to from, from focusing on strategic planning to talking about scenario planning? Uh, I think it was um, the utility of it. Um, people get lost in the middle of a long-term strategic plan. Uh, do you need plans? Yes, of course you do. You need a vision and knowing where you want to go, but a vision without a, a, an actionable plan is still a hallucination. So, uh, but you have to have the vision of where you want, want to go. And then you actually, to me, uh, the notion of a scenario, which in essence is just a futuristic story told through the eyes of a, pro a protagonist, is much, much more digestible um, by, you know, the troops or, you know, just people in general, they can identify with it. And if they're involved in coming up with the future stories and actually running, let's say, some workshops where they're involved and they share their their thoughts about where the organization wants to be in the future, that's huge. And you vet them. And so mm -hmm. I developed a little methodology how to do that and ran some of those workshops. Oh, OK. Uh, uh, attached to your blog are, are two two documents you wanted to share with folks. One is an article in the Futurist magazine, and then is another sort of like a cheat sheet. Can you describe each of those? Sure. I mean the um, the article called "Narrating the Vision," and it's uh, you have it posted up there. It's a PDF file. Uh, was the cover story in Futurist magazine, and. Um, it really kind of lays out the whole process or, um, of how to create scenarios and then the whole notion of why scenarios. You have to have a rationale for it to begin with. And then um, the great thing about the article was that the, at the Futurist magazine, they had some phenomenal graphics editors and they put together a, 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 the sidebars on it where the key strategic thoughts are uh, illuminated. And you have to write these things with a purpose. Uh, and then back when the article came out, you know, I was trying to, you know, uh, get diversity into the scenario. I was uh, uh, also uh, trying to say there's really no separation between home and work anymore, so on and so forth. Uh, and that was for the National Transportation Safety Board. Okay. And how they, how they operate in the future. And what about the little handout that is also uh, appended to your 
Blah. Yeah, they had some, rec- uh, some uh, references in the back of it. It talks about why scenario planning, uh, what constitutes a good scenario, um, how to vet them, what to do with them. Um, if you can uh, think about it, I mean, this is not in that two pager, but I really encourage people to go out. And if you remember, um, Apple came out with a very short video and it was called the Knowledge Navigator. And I encourage people to go out on YouTube and just put in Apple and Knowledge Navigator and look at it. Um, It's a video and I will, uh, it was produced in 1986. And if you look at it, that's in essence a, a video production of where Apple wanted to go. But if you can think about a futuristic scenario as a screenplay that you want, you want to be able to uh, produce later on in a video or some other means, just voiceover slides or whatever else for an organization, it's huge. It's huge in terms of getting the story out there of where the organization is going. Of course, as von Malky said, uh, you know, the German theorist, military theorist, he says, no plan survives contact with the enemy. Uh, <laughs> or as, as yeah. Mike Tyson says, yeah. everybody has Mike a plan. Tyson, uh, uh, everybody Tyson has a plan said, until they... No, no fight plan survives getting punched in the face. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, that's his that's classic right. line. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. you, have to, you have to adapt. You have to adapt. But, you know, if you... You get people at least going in the same direction instead of in 360 degrees in all different directions. That's huge. And if you have the futuristic story, it can become the stump speech for the leaders of the organization. Before and, we start talking about some of those stump speeches, I'm going to bring in some of our other folks sure. who are going to participate in it. Uh, Gordon Basetius is going to join us, and then uh, David Lang. And James and James Page and Lewis Hicks. Uh, Bob, you're you're new to the what the 1960s project, but you've got a I've got a veteran bench here that they've been to the <laughs> before. <laughs> so uh, Gordon, I, I'm going to start with you because I, I know a little bit about your background. You also <clears throat> actually like Bob make your make your money. Yes, your business is thinking about the future. Uh, what what did you what do you take away from having looked at Bob's stuff or listening to him talk? I read your stuff with great interest, Bob. We walk the same ground in certain places. Uh, most of my stuff is in the private sector, but it's pretty much the same stuff. And also about the stories and how a story elucidates something that you want to get across to different people. I find, and I was going to ask you that no matter how you describe it, whether it's a story, whether it's fact, whether it's ever, the more disruptive it is, it seems the more resistant your audience is. I mean, uh, the example I would point out is the World Economic Forum, which I'm sure you're familiar, right. announced in 2015, 2016, that the fourth industrial revolution is upon us, at which point just about everybody did absolutely nothing. And now we're sitting in the shock of it as stores start to fold and different industries start to prove that they are just obsolete. And now the weak links are exposed due to the COVID and other, you know, the economic downturn. I wanted to get your, your feeling on that and how that worked for you, you know, how you see that. Um, there are certain macro trends. I'll go back in history a little bit. Of, um, probably the most, one of the most uh, uh, disruptive interventions in warfare was the stirrup. Why? Because uh, you had maneuver warfare and you had mounted warfare. You could either shoot a bow and arrow from a a horse as you were moving. You weren't a stationary target or a rifle or whatever else. So if you look at, you take it all the way up to modern times and you look at all of the the digitization of everything. And then, you know, I mean, I think it was Bill Gates who, who back in 2015 talked about, you know, the next thing that's a uh, big challenge is going to be a pandemic. People just didn't listen. They didn't like what they hear. People don't like radical change. They like incremental change. 
But every once in a while, different folks have to get up and say, I really think and uh, these are the macro level trends that are pushing us in this direction. It was about a year ago, I ran a um, futuristic, futuristic scenario workshop for a 1400 person firm in, um, in Alexandria, Virginia. They have uh, you know engineers down, you know, real rocket scientists down in Huntsville, Alabama. And the the interesting part about it is we didn't anticipate a pandemic. Okay, we we did not do that, but we really looked at um, the influence of artificial intelligence and machine learning, and how that's going to affect organizations, and um, you know just employment in organizations. And then, you know, whether um, you're going to have certain uh, decisions, decisions that are going to be automatically made, vice having, you know, a person in the loop, so to speak. And there was a bunch of debates. You got, you got uh, into, uh, yes, technology leads, law and policy lag. Uh, you get those arguments and then you get the more humanistic thing to say, well, what are people going to do for employment if you're not in the loop? So those issues came out and, you know, senior leadership and boards of directors have to start addressing that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we're going to we're going to talk about a scenario toward the end. But before we go there, uh, David, what do you, you have any uh, you have any questions for Bob or any comments? Well, I, I would be interested in um, getting your viewpoints on um, Alfred Toffler's future shock and whether uh, you agree or whether you see things differently from uh, his analysis. Um, we had Toffler, I think, in, if I'm not uh, mistaken, Jerome, we had him in to the Information Resources Management College once or twice. And I think I even mm -hmm. went out to dinner with him at that point one night. And uh, I'm not so sure about, you know, his forward looking, uh, some of it was a little bit dystopian, I think. But um, I think, you know, I'm a firm believer in technology, and I think technology is a disruptive force, whether it's the knitting mills and the Luddites or whatever else, or, uh, uh, you know, just how the Googles of the world and the Amazons of the world have taken over a lot of retail. Uh, but I think this whole push into the 21st century and the information and the knowledge era. And I'm, I'm actually saying the knowledge era because you're going to have, in essence, synthetic knowledge with machine learning. And um, it's a question of whether it's harvested, uh, harvested and used for good or for evil. And then um, I think it was um, a book. I have it in my bookshelf behind me. I can't remember the title back away, but Bill Joy was arguing uh, you know, the fun, uh, I think he's the founder of Sun Microsystems. One of the founders, uh, could be wrong on that, um, was talking about it for, uh, for evil, meaning military purposes. And then um, <clears throat> I think it was Ray Kurzweil who was talking about it for good. So probably we would not, we would not have a vaccine uh, if, in fact, uh, we could not, one, coordinate, collaborate on a human uh, basis across all of these different firms who are developing a vaccine, as well as, uh, as the scientific knowledge and the, um, uh, the genetic uh, code and the RNA code was not shared, you know, across boundaries. And that's huge. Okay, uh, James, you, you have any comments or questions? Well, I, I like Dave. When, when you know, Robert was talking, uh, I immediately thought of Alvin Hoffler, but not so much in terms of his concepts. But I remember reading the book in the 70s, and the thing that just stood out for me was his, the idea that there had been so many inventions between, I think that book came out in 1970. There had been so many inventions between World War II. There had been more inventions between World War II and 1970 that had been in the whole of mankind. And now when I think about it now, you know, and Jerome had mentioned, you know, that there was just such a tremendous jump when we went from analog to digital. Yep. And things just started changing just so rapidly. And I really resonated with your comment about people 
for being grounded in the past. For, for, you know, my statement had always been that people are trying to go through life looking through a rearview mirror. And um, you just, and so I really appreciate, uh, you know, just much of what you said because we do have to be prepared. You know, Jerome and I were talking the other day, and of course, you know, everybody sort of agrees that the only, the only constant is change. And so if you're not prepared for that, and, and you know, I, I work with mostly nonprofits and dragging them along is just painful. So, so I really appreciate, you know, your thoughts and, and they've, really been help, they've really been helpful in terms of just framing what life, you know, looks like now. So thank you. Sure. Um... One thing I think I could possibly recommend, uh, I ran a, a workshop for a law firm in New York City, really great location right at Rockefeller Center. And uh, <clears throat> the whole point is I like sweat equity from clients. So in other words, before they even got into the workshop, they had to go out and they had to come up with, you know, what are the macro level forces that are going to change uh, law practices in the future? And uh, everybody had to, you know, and nobody wanted to look stupid in front of their peers. Everybody had to come up and say, what did you get? You had to share it ahead of time, but then they actually had to talk about it. So they actually had to read it if they get up. No one wants to look silly in front of their peers. So, um, <clears throat> got them out of their comfort zone before they even got into the room. <laughs> and that way it's 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 kind of huge and and one fellow came in and he actually had um, an article and a video of how a law firm operates in the UK and especially with younger lawyers and it was a lot of virtual stuff a lot of uh, laptops with docking stations you know none of those big bookcases with all the law books in the mm -hmm. back Everything was done virtually and so on and so forth. And, and all of these, you know, partners in a, in a large law firm were saying, oh, boy, things are going to change. So that's just something that sweat equity ahead of time. You got to come in with something to add to the group right away before you even get in the room. Okay. Hey, Lou. Very good. Uh, Lou, um, what, 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 you have any questions or comments? Yes, I sure do. Bob, you um, kind of alluded to, and, and James's question kind of uh, uh, piggybacked on what I was curious about. I um, am a former manager, and one of the ways I had to adapt was to uh, think about um, what would happen with my budgeting. And being an administrator of a museum for several years, I was always underfunded. So um, I find um, what you're talking about very fascinating because it marries, like you just said, strategic planning will bore somebody to tears. But um, I'm curious about how you might marry the two, strategic planning and uh, future planning. Um, I think even your the example you just gave kind of um, talks about that, but if you can kind of uh, share your thoughts about how that might proceed because uh, scenarios uh, and stories as a historian um, I think this is a perfect way for us to think about how we look into the future. If you get your stakeholders and, your, and some of your senior people and even your junior people to kind of come up in a workshop to say, I would require students at the National Defense University to be able to write a two-page scenario and they had to stand up in front of everybody in there in, the, in class and, and read it out loud. And then we would do a content analysis of it. I would have people up on the butcher boards on the side saying, what did you hear from an organizational culture change? What did you hear from a technology change? What did you uh, uh, hear from a business process change? And so on and so forth. And the people who were up on the boards would actually write down all of the interventions that were in the futuristic scenario. So you give, you give everybody a chance to say, you know, if you king or queen, what would this organization look like X amount of years into the future, told through the eyes of a protagonist? Once you get that out there and you kind of come up with possibly, possibly a, a composite story, 
then you really get into the strategic plan, which is uh, how do you make it happen? What is the task? Who's going to do it? And how much does it cost? And when is the deliverable? That's the key thing where the, it makes the, uh, the vision and the actual futurist, uh, futuristic story a reality. The nice thing about having the story as a senior leader, yourself, museum directors, or whoever, is they have a, t uh, a story to tell to benefactors as well as funding sources. Uh, I think it was the head of the Congressional Budget Office that said organizations without the re requisite budget aren't too impressive. It was a very, very telling line if you were, uh, you know, in an agency. And, and I mean, I think that's why a lot of agencies actually just compete in the budget process. And in the public sector, there's another great line. The capacity to budget is the capacity to govern. Hmm. And you can just take that into the private sector. The capacity to budget and secure funding is the, is the um, capacity to execute your mission, whatever it is. And not to dominate the conversation, but just to add a comment um, in answering that you almost, you jumped to my next question. I was going to ask, you know, with future planning, is strategic planning even necessary? But you just lawlessly answered that because I was thinking this would be a replacement for strategic planning since everybody looks at the strategic plan initially and then they put it on the shelf and go about their business without really going back to look to see how they need to adjust it. I think Thanks. I mentioned that, you know, a plan without, uh, excuse me, a vision without uh, a plan is a hallucination. I think there was some, I don't know, I've forgotten who said it, but I'm quoting somebody there. That's not my own. And, um, but the whole point is, uh, yes, you, you need the project management types to be able to execute the plan. And to be diligent about saying, okay, who's doing what, when, how much is it going to cost, and what's the deliverable? Are we on time or are we behind? But you also need folks in an organization who can think, uh, uh, forward think. And they're all wonderful skills in organizations, and you need that broad cross-section of, of people to, to pull it off. Let, let me ask Gordon, uh, can you lay out a brief set of circumstances or conditions and maybe have Bob chime in on him in terms of how he might approach it as a from a scenario planning standpoint? I think a very realistic consideration right now is given with China and given the, the changes in China is we're going to look for alternate sources for critical materials in our supply chains, both domestically and globally. I'm involved in that to some extent in due diligence and the rest of it. But overall, this is a huge concept. It's a huge operation in anybody's, in anybody's book. How this rolls out and how it will roll out, if it will roll out, you know, with any kind of expedition remains to be seen. I wanted to get your take on it and see how you look at this because, you know, obviously it's going on. Uh, believe it or not, when I was a student at the Industrial College of the Armed Forces, uh, I learned of a thing called strategic assessments, and they were put out by the Institute of National Strategic Studies. I'll get to the point in a minute. And then when I was a faculty member, I wrote a chapter for that uh, with a gentleman by the name of Jerry Abbott, and it was about the information systems and telecommunications industry. And the whole um, point of the strategic assessment is saying, you know, then where are we going to get our chips? You know, where are we going to get our computer chips? Uh, are they going to be domestically manufactured? Or are they going to come from Taiwan? Are they going to come from Japan? So on and so forth. Uh, and then you have to really get into um, some research to be able to find out who's manufacturing what, if it's a strategic material. I mean, a lot of minerals, there's a, there's a whole chapter on strategic minerals. And then where do they come from? I mean, I, that's why the Chinese are, in, in many cases, are going into South America for strategic minerals and, uh, you know, places in Africa. So, um, you know, there's a geopolitical component to a lot, a lot of this. And there's also a lot of just really gut level research. But then I think you have to evaluate where we go from this with different, different stories and or vectors that say, all right, 
Do we want to partner with somebody who is an in quote ally? I mean, you know, do we want to do something with the Canadians, you know, because they do a better job at it than we do? Uh, do we want to go it alone? Do we want to manufacture it alone? Uh, uh, you know, and then you have to really kind of game it out to be able to find out, you know, what's the uh, and, and weigh risk against opportunity. And that's the key thing, I think, that, um, you know, try to, to come up with and get the cumulative neuroses of a group. And I'm using that pejoratively there to say, hey, which way are we going to go here? And, um, you know, it's almost like uh, Edward de Bono's work. You know, you want a black hat thinker, you want a green hat thinker, you want an integrative thinker, you want somebody to kind of critically evaluate everything that you say and your assumptions behind it. And then you might actually come up with a possible feasible approach or approaches to move forward. Well, let me ask both Bob and Gordon the question. Did either you use uh, game theory? Economists are big on using game theory. Do you either use game theory in developing your scenarios or coming up with your alternative strategies? Uh, Gordon <laughs> and Robert. Game theory is extremely prevalent right now especially in AI, machine learning, which gives rise to robotics and automation in different forms, which is coming on very strongly right now. We don't see it. It's again, it's one of these things in the future that is almost upon us in a big way. And meanwhile, it's not being acknowledged anywhere we see really in a big way. But with this, with this COVID pandemic, it's coming on even stronger. And the game theory and figuring out, mapping out things is extremely vital and valuable at this particular juncture. Bob, what, does game theory play much in your work? I have not um, used game theory so much. Maybe it's been implied in some of the scenarios, but it hasn't come out as, uh, you know, uh, overtly in it. It's, I'm, I'm trying to get usually the, um, the different members in the senior leadership uh, okay. to kind of say, you know, here's where we want to go. What do you envision for the future? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, David, you, you're in the public sector. Does any of this play out in your job or in your agency? Any well, scenario? my agency is going through a so-called digital transformation. And the consensus of the rank and file is that the uh, digitization of everything takes away from the actual work that we do because you have to spend more time with data entry. Uh, there's a lot of statistics generated that are meaningless. Uh, you've got systems that are set into place to prevent mistakes from being made. But the, uh, I'll give you an example. We have a system called customer management relations. And so if a customer calls and says, I've got a, a housing code violation in my apartment, we want to send an inspector out, uh, then um, that system will assign that customer to somebody in the agency. Uh, someone in the agency might pass it on to the right uh, unit or they might not. It becomes like a hot potato because we have a service level agreement and someone is supposed to respond within three days. And so you have a, a, a situation where people just pass the customer along just to get it off their plate so they won't have a breach. And so you get this, you know, basically hot potato uh, process taking place that takes away totally from uh, providing service to the customers or solving problems. So I don't see, you know, the digitalization being useful in that regard because it's, it's only being designed to generate a uh, meaningless statistics uh, for propaganda purposes, basically uh, budget purposes, et cetera, but it doesn't actually help the citizens and it creates a lot of, stress on the part of the, the workforce. I Bob, can good. you comment on that? <laughs> well, I think, I mean, I, I, you know, th this sounds like, you know, the old classic, um, these, uh, you're measuring process me measures versus outcome measures. Right. So in other words, you know, what are you really measuring here? I mean, right. you, know, you, were, you were perfect in saying that this really didn't do anything for the citizen. That's the outcome measure. The process measure is just throughput. Um, you know, how many, you know, how many times did you pass off the hot potato? Uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to be cavalier here. 
But I mean, it's um, this seems almost more like a business process reengineering kind of thing, the process reengineering, and, and then to focus on outcome measures, vice process or output measures. Yeah, yeah that was that was that was big when we were doing the uh, oh, yeah. government performance and results act. So I have many sessions on trying to get people to distinguish between input measures, process or, th or throughput measures, output measures. And outcome measures. Yep. Those are that's a classic framework we try to use to help people understand. And the major challenge that we face is that if it's a true outcome measure, the agency really doesn't have control over it. It's, it's somebody else has to make a determination, stakeholders, the customers, as to whether or not you are able, you met what you were saying you knew. But as, as you pointed out, Bob. We get we get caught up on the process measures, and and not and 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 you lose sight of what the goal is. I think the classic example that I used to use was okay. Let's uh, talk about K through 12 education, right? We put th people through an industrial conveyor belt in a process, you know, going K through 12, um, and then you have an output measure that you know, when you reach 12th grade here in the United States, you graduate and there's a graduating class of let's say 300. That's an output measure. The outcome measure, however, is that the students who graduate can read, can write, do basic math, and that they are ready and do not need renewable, renewable, uh, um, Remedial. Remedial. That's the word I'm looking for. Thank you, Jerome. Remedial <laughs> education to go to college and they don't have to take courses to get up to speed. So in other words, as Jerome said, the stakeholder on the outside the university, um, says, OK, yeah, I've got an outcome measure here that I can live with. Well, Bob, you, know, you, you mentioned several examples of several types of clients. Can you walk through a futuristic scenario? that you have uh, presented I, uh, to an organization? Yeah, I mean, I was, um, after I left the National Defense University, I, I was chief knowledge officer of the United States Army. And, um, you know, like, for those of you, like an SES type, a senior executive over in the Army, Department of the Army. And I wrote um, a knowledge management, the knowledge management principles about uh, how you share um, good ideas across the entire army. And what I did is I had um, 12 principles associated with it that all organizations, both warfighting commands, as well as um, uh, logistics commands in the army, they call it from uh, tooth to tail, what they should do to capture their intellectual capital and make it structural capital. What does that mean? Kind of take your ideas, um, that's your intellectual capital, and then structural capital is digitize it. So it's in zeros and ones, so why? So you can share it across an organization. And the, what I did, and I had to go brief the chief staff of the army, that's the head of the army, and then the secretary of the army to get it signed out. And what I did is I actually wrote a futuristic scenario of how it would work. It was called the specialist Alfredo scenario. And I looked at the, all 12 principles through the eyes of a soldier. And it was, in essence, a three-act play. And it started in theater. Um, it was in Afghanistan. And then it went uh, with um, uh, Specialist Alfredo getting wounded and coming back to the U.S. And he had such and such an injury that he just didn't go to an army hospital. They, you went out and you got uh, the necessary um, uh, protocols from uh, it was Georgetown and uh, George Washington to be able to meet his needs at that particular point in time. And uh, the part of this story that I thought was important is you have to go through the entire organization, all of the United States Army commands and get it signed off ahead of time. And then when you go in and you, you meet with the chief, they don't suffer fools. And my boss was a three star, what they call the Army CIO G6. And, uh, you know, he says, uh, this is Dr. Nielsen, da -da 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 -da, and it was my nickel. The reason the chief signed it out, and he told me right then and there, was he said, you had a story in there, so I could understand it. And you looked at it through the eyes of a soldier. 
So what does this mean to the troops on the ground? And then he also said, is this going to cost me any, any money? And I said, no, sir. And he said, okay, I'm signing it. And, you know, <laughs> around, around, around the table were other three stars who, was, who were stone-faced until they saw which way the chief wanted to go. Mm. So that's an example of how, you know, to kind of get your stuff out there and approved. And then I did the same thing with the secretary of the army. Uh, 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 Louis, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I w kind of was curious about, you know, with planning, this sounds all wonderful and everything, but as a manager, uh, and I think that's an excellent example to give us a broader way of thinking, but what kind of pitfalls have you run into with this method of um, planning for the future and marrying it with strategic planning? I really, I, I, I mean, I've come in and run the workshops and they, they pay me nicely to run the workshops. I don't really follow up with the folks later on, <laughs> although, although I had one um, client, uh, a 1400 person technology firm come back a year later and said, we produced a video of what we came up with in the workshop a year ago. And they shared it with me. So in other words, they took it to heart, in essence, when I mentioned that the story, in essence, is a screenplay. And then you can do what you want with it. What I did with that specialist Alfredo story is I actually uh, had a contractor make, uh, and we, we called it a movie trailer. So uh, it was only about two minutes long, but it got to the point of it. So when I did presentations in Korea or wherever else, I would show the specialist Alfredo uh, uh, movie trailer, and then we'd kind of get into the whole point of it. So, um, you know, the actual execution of the plan, that was left to the people who really are there. They know the organization. I was a hired gun coming in, let's face it, okay? Well, I, I'm gonna. I got. I got. Somebody was having trouble posting on the chat box, so I got a text uh, from my colleague uh, Sharon. It's 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 more of a comment than a question. And she writes, "I've been involved in both strategic planning and scenario vision planning related to transportation and community development. Both processes are needed for public policy development." Mm -hmm. The strategic plan serves as the guiding document slash principles. Uh, and the scenario plan is more about implementation. So as she says further that strategic planning addresses the critical questions or at least considers the key strategic, strategic issues. Scenario planning is more of a wish list and unrelated and ultimate desired outcomes. So she she adds most frequently, she, she's, chatting right along with me now as I'm talking. <laughs> so a whole other side conversation going on over here. Uh, so she says, scenario planning is definitely based on storytelling. Uh, yes. Planning is much more arduous. There's no clear storyline other than planning for continued existence and relevance. So I think she's echoing what everybody is saying. So the yeah, her view, at least from the public sector, she worked at the She's now retired from the DC Department of Transportation. I guess for them, the reason that they did the planning was to try to uh, justify their existence and their relevance, the not really transforming uh, broad uh, issues. And James, you're you're in the behavioral health sphere, and there's a lot going on over there. How, how does this relate? Does this relate to what you're doing? Are you? We have to unmute you. Okay. Uh, very, very much so. I mean, I'm listening. Um, there's so many parallels. Uh, you know, you David talked about measuring process. Uh, I come from it in the behavioral health field is that you measure compliance. Like you're not really measuring outcomes. You just uh, <coughs> excuse me. How many times did you see the client? Da 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 da. But you're not really you're not really doing that. And and. The real challenge now, especially as we, as, as we look into the future, uh, you know, most uh, helping professions has always been face-to-face. -face. You visit the client's home, 
you meet them somewhere, you, you do all that. And so now that, you know, it's being done digitally and being done online, it's, it's, it's a double challenge because one, you're dealing with poor people. And so technology, the technology, this is when you start to see the digital divide just come to just, you know, it just, it just manifests itself. And then we're stuck in, even though we're in, in the midst of dealing with technology, we're stuck in the past. Uh, we really need to come up with ways in which our interaction can be done through the phone. Like to continue to delude yourself into thinking that people who, you know, have no income at all are going to have high speed internet and a way to interact with you is just not practical. And so this has been very helpful in terms of just beginning to look at that through a different lens. Um, and one of the groups that I'm working with now, and that's the real challenge. And because it's all of what you said gets in there, because in compliance, you're trying to justify your existence. You're really not trying to figure out how you're helping people. And then, as you mentioned earlier, Jerome, you know, whether you're helping people is not to be determined by the uh, by politicians, it's being determined by the people that you really want to help. And nobody's listening to them. And interestingly, it's because nobody wants to hear their story. <laughs> so that's, that's, so that's, that's, that's been my thing. Yeah. Let me say, let me, what about COVID? Anybody doing, are you, either of you, uh, Rob, Bob, or Gordon doing any scenario planning around the effects of COVID and the rollout of vaccines? Or, or as I haven't, I, I haven't uh, done anything in that area. Would I like to? Sure. Um, but, and I have a whole host of different, you know, approaches and vet them. But uh, no, I have not. I don't mm -hmm. know if anybody else there has. Okay. Well, Gordon, has, you, has the COVID played in your work? I mean, you mentioned that one of the uh, one of the effects of COVID has it ushered in the uh, fourth industrial revolution because it was moving along slowly. Then COVID came, and then it, the the new thing was was there and had to be come into come into operation much quicker than we had anticipated. We have to get your mic on there, Gordon. Mm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, in certain areas indirectly, no, we're not involved in like the out, you know, the rolling out of COVID necessarily or the vaccine or anything. Like I say, that we have companies approach us that are looking for alternate sources for critical materials. And we do the due diligence and the vetting on those potentially alternate sources is one of the areas that we work in. And that's probably the most key one. And plus also the, the revamping of the workforce in general and how we have to accommodate it and how we have to implement different things on the fly because you don't have a long-term planning because everything is happening in real time and how companies are readjusting and how we in turn have to readjust with them and to, to meet their needs and to, uh, acclimate to what their their immediate uh, forces are, how many resources they have and what they can use with them, it becomes a whole different scenario than it was, say, a year ago or two years ago, for sure. Yeah, we, we got it. We have a couple other questions uh, coming in. I'm getting them from all different parts. Uh, technology, I might even be bringing them in from the, from the great beyond. <laughs> but... Uh, Bob, uh, what do you see as the potential dangers of artificial intelligence? Um, is there any realistic danger of the 2001 space odyssey? How computer takeover? I I, I think uh, we just wrote. Uh, I'm I'm involved with a group called um, K Yield, it's the Yield Management and Knowledge, and we in essence are trying to come up with a an operating system for an organization that actually is based in machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, <clears throat> the notion of having a person in the loop of any decision is huge. And, um, you know, you have to measure potential outcomes and, and whatever it is, let's say if you're trying to come up with uh, 
uh, treating somebody's, uh, when you can go through somebody's DNA in the medical field, and then you go through, I don't know how many different journals, let's say 30,000 different journals, and you come up with protocols, recent research, and then um, <clears throat> I think there's something now that, um, what do they call it? Uh, it's almost pre-peer review publication of, uh, of, of things, and they did a lot of that with uh, COVID research. If you can comb through all of that and come up with a protocol to treat somebody who has, let's say, a uh, <clears throat> very rare liver disease, you have to assign a risk factor to that in terms of saying, well, this has never d been done before. We don't have longitudinal studies for it. It hasn't been through peer review. What do we do? So these are some of the issues, and you have to get into data privacy, huge data privacy issues. Um, <clears throat> I mean, in China right now, they, uh, <clears throat> they're huge data sets of people's behavior. And it's almost like it's a point system. You know how, like, you know, when you buy something, you get so many points, you know, at uh, whatever store that you're going to, and then you, you redeem your points. Well, they, they have it for citizens. And, you know, you get negative points if you get a ticket, you know, a speeding ticket. And then, uh, you know, if you're, you know, spitting on the sidewalk and a camera catches you, that's not a good thing. That's not a good thing. So it's almost like they are just tracking you every which way. And, you know, they, they want you to be a quasi, I hate to say it, automatron and, and, and meet the Chinese mold of what constitutes a good citizen. And that is just huge in terms of privacy issues. So <clears throat> all of these things, uh, you know, ethically have to be kind of uh, 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 evaluated. And I don't think anybody's got, uh, you know, the right, you know, but will technology lead and will policy and uh, let's say the ethical considerations lag? Yeah, I bet it will. I bet mm -hmm. they will. I bet they will. Hey, Bob, I, it was, we had a little fundamental question here and it, it really takes me back to our RMC days. Could you explain the difference between data, information, knowledge, and wisdom? Um, I'll try. <clears throat> Data is a factoid, okay? It's a little factoid, like the number one. A information is you're putting it in further context. I have one orange, okay? So that's a little bit information. <clears throat> Knowledge says, well, an orange is good for me, especially because it's got vitamin C. So therefore, I think I will eat the orange. Wisdom may say, well, look, um, oranges also contain a lot of sugar. And that, yes, I'll get my vitamin C, but I'm 10 pounds overweight right now, and I don't want the additional sugar in my system to generate extra calories. And if I'm diabetic, it has other uh, 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 implications. And then, but yet, I like... Uh, um, growers in Florida, and I want to support them. Uh, so the wisdom is, you know, like, what do you do at that particular point in time? You're probably going to look at it through your own eyeballs and say, no, I'm not going to eat the orange. Okay. Great. Well, let's, let's see if anybody has any, we'll save you for last, but if anybody have any parting words, we'll go from Gordon to David to James to uh, Lewis, and then we'll end up with Bob. I think one of the things to take away, I agree with Bob on this, that technology will definitely precede any kind of governance and any kind of regulation on it. I don't see how that horse isn't already so far out of the barn that uh, it's immeasurable to what's going to take place. And the same thing with the social system that Bob was just pointing out in China, which we're seeing to some degree, very minor degree so far as data gets increasingly collected in this country, we're seeing different appraisals and different values being placed on different things that normally, say 15, 20 years ago, we would never even cared about or given it a thought. And China, of course, is far more to use a, it's, to say advanced, it's not really covered, but China is much more further down the road 
with their social system and keeping people in line and creating what is automatons essentially or trying to anyway okay. and that's why you see things like uh like for example if you fall out of line with it you head out of pace in your figurehead like jack ma all of a sudden you disappear for three months and nobody knows where the hell you are so that's just part of it too you know it's it's a strict system and we got to really be careful here with that david we're gonna bring your mic on okay you said my mic is not on it's on now okay it was never off i think um i'm most concerned with the development of artificial intelligence and where that's leading us and as bob indicated i believe you must always have the human being with the spirit and the soul uh, ultimately in control of our systems. Otherwise, if you just leave it to artificial intelligence, uh, we're living in a soulless world. And James, right, Mike? <laughs> yeah, one of my takeaways, Rob Bob, and I really appreciate it, is really recognizing the tug of the past that we, uh, this is just so difficult to, uh, I think that's part of the whole political process that we're divided, not necessarily, it's almost like we're divided into two groups, one that's looking to the future and one that's trying to hold on to the past. And that that's what I see as one of the real challenges. Um, go on. Great point. Lewis? One of the things I, I'm thinking about is um, <clears throat> as a retiree and those people uh, having to contemplate going back into the buildings and the offices, what's going to be our new model for the businesses as they survive to um, fill these offices where we have lots of building going on in D.C.? Um, also, the struggle for gentrification and the balance between uh, having a livable city and uh, what we're dealing with and realizing what's really important as we shelter in place with COVID. Okay, Bob, you have any one of parting words? Yeah, let me circle back to, back to the 60s since this is the theme, uh, Jerome. And um, when Kennedy said, uh, when JFK said, uh, we're gonna put a man on the moon in X amount of years, that was a futuristic vision of where he wanted to go. Dr. King's speech, you know, um, with all of the elements that he had, it, it, it had in it. We need more things that are out there from a governmental standpoint, whether that's uh, 5G for everybody, whether it's, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, whatever, whatever the issue is, universal health care, I don't care what it is, but we need to have some markers out there and then have a whole bunch of scenarios or, or uh, approaches to get there, to rally the country, uh, together. That's from a political standpoint. I'm a firm believer that <clears throat> education is the key to the future. And if we don't invest in our own intellectual capital, no one else is going to do it for us. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll take one shot at a previous administration when they had no child left behind policy. No, I like the notion of every child excelled to their ability. So in other words, you need to set a marker out there so that kids who are the future are investing in their own intellectual capital and that they share it across boundaries. And you can digitize it and share it and leverage it. So um, I'm encouraged, but yet realistic about the future. Um, and I don't know, I just kind of an optimistic guy and I think, um, Hopefully we'll we'll get there sometime, and uh, the better angels will prevail. Well, thank to all my guests. Uh, this is the season two, episode one of uh, the 1960s project. We are focusing on voices from the 1960s, and we've been talking with Bob Nielsen about what it means to be a futuristic, a futurist, and scenario planning. Uh, we invite you to tune in next week, also to check out our blogs on the website, and also look at the videos on our YouTube channel. Uh, thank you and have a good evening. Thank you.